It's my very great pleasure to introduce our next inaugural lecture, lecturer, Professor Mohammed Shamin Khan. Shamin, uh, as Shamin trained in medicine uh, at Dow Medical University in Karachi in Pakistan, and then uh, un- came to the UK and trained uh, in his postgraduate clinical training both in the UK and again in Ireland. We were fortunate to um, uh, attract Shamin to uh, his appointment as, uh, at, at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital um, in 1999, where he holds the post as consultant in neurology. You are going to hear of the very many uh, uh, exploits of Shamin, which both within the university and beyond, I have no doubt, a true polymath of uh, uh, contributions um, to humanity. So, Shamin, may I invite you to give your inaugural lecture. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure and honor to be giving this lecture. I never dreamt I will be doing this, but anyhow, it is a reality and I'm here. So firstly, uh, you will be wondering why I chose this title of my talk. But as we go along, then you will realize the philosophy behind it. Thank you. Okay. So, firstly, I thank Richard for organizing this event, for all of you to be coming such a late in the evening. I'm very thankful to these three individuals who helped me in editing my talk. And I apologize for using these two words, I and me, because my feeling is that you can never do anything alone. And therefore, you should interpret that I use I and me as we and us. Life, it starts with a very undemocratic process because we are not given the choice of the country, color, race, religion of the family. Just like buying a lottery ticket, millions buy every day, but there are very few jackpot winners and most losers. In my case, I was born in a family with 11 children. Because of the high mortality, only six survived, and I was one of them. My mother never attended a school, and my father was working in the army as a clerk and earning a very small amount. So you can imagine how you manage your life. I went to a primary school which had no building. There are things about relationships, that when you are up Your friends and relatives know who you are. But when you are down, you know who your friends and relatives are. In my case, I was fortunate 
to have a maternal uncle who had only primary qualification and worked as a security guard in Pakistan railways, earning about 30 pounds a month. So he was kind enough to take me to Karachi, which is a city in Pakistan, for a better education. And he lived in a shared accommodation with no light or indoor toilet facilities. However, because he was employed in railways, I managed to get into this school for better education. But the study of teaching or study is Urdu, not English. And that's why you can figure out that my accent is not English. It is more like Eastern English. I have, was fortunate to have a brother-in-law who also helped me with periodic tuition and financial support. I went to this science college in Karachi to do my A-levels and then to this medical university in Karachi. Fortunately, in the country, the education was free. And therefore, I feel that I owe a moral debt to the country where I studied my primary degree. Once you graduate, if you come from a poor background, you have a dilemma whether you put your family first or your career first. And undoubtedly, you have to put your family first and your career comes second. Because I didn't earn enough in Pakistan, I had to leave the country to go to another country to earn better wages, and I went to Oman, which is in the Middle East. But while I was there, four important events happened. Firstly, <laughs> I'm dead. 10th June in 1987, I got married, but I never met my wife before. But this was after a formal interview with my father-in-law, God bless him, who was a director of education, a sensible man, and he thought I was the right person for his daughter. And when you have never seen your wife and you're going to spend a life with her, you just wonder how would she look like? But when we saw each other, we were happy that, okay, we can accept each other. My wife is a doctor. She studied in Lahore University. She, in fact, when we came to Dublin, I will tell you subsequently, she did a diploma in gynae and ops, but had to sacrifice her career because we have four daughters. And it was not possible for her and me to go into career at the same time. The second thing I did when I was in Oman, I passed the FRCS board, studied with my friend, who is an orthopedic surgeon now in India, and I had two daughters born in Oman. And I also met a professor, Douglas Roy, who was a professor from Queen's University, Belfast, and he recommended for a job in Northern Ireland. So I came to Northern Ireland in 1909. <laughs> Fortunately, he wasn't that powerful. I didn't have much say. Otherwise, I might have been deported back to Oman. When you choose your specialties or subspecialties, you have role models. Every one of us has a role model. And to me, there were two role models. Professor Adib Rizvi, this man has a philosophy that we cannot let them die just because they cannot afford to live. And based on this philosophy, he has worked for the last 40 years to establish an institution which treats nearly a million patients a year free of cost. And the second person I was very impressed with, and he was helpful, was Professor Jamshir Talati an academic, very refined individual, and still working as a professor in Aragon University in Karachi. So in my career, I have tried to blend these two philosophies of academia and also the voluntary work. 
So while I was in Northern Ireland, I tried to get into urology. I wouldn't get an unpaid job in urology. And I left Northern Ireland, went to Scotland to work with Professor Geoffrey Chisholm. Then I went back to Northern Ireland and subsequently to the Republic of Ireland to finish off my training. And there were a few very kind individuals who helped me not only to train, but also to support me at every stage of my career when I was in Northern Ireland. I was appointed to Guys in St. Thomas's in July 99, and the chairman of the committee was Patricia Moberly. I have enormous respect for this lady who's recently passed away, but she was a very nice lady who knew so many names of the staffs in Guy's and St. Thomas's, I couldn't believe it. Once you become consultant, your life takes several dimensions. So the clinic, because I'm a, I'm a clinician, so clinical work is the top thing, then the science, education and training, international work, and the family. So I will take you through these aspects of my career. Very first day I arrived in Guy's Hospital, my senior colleague, Richard Tiptoff, a great visionary, he gave me the CV of my first registrar. And he told me that this registrar is coming tomorrow to join the department, and I want you to look after him. He's very bright, and I can foresee he will become professor in very near future. So here was my first <laughs> registrar, Prokar Das Gupta. So we started our jobs at the same time. So he, we met him in theater, and I asked him to do a radical nephrectomy very first day. He had never worked with me, but after having seen his CV and references, I thought he can do this. And ever since, we have been very close friends, colleagues, and we have worked together for the last 17 years. He's obviously much younger than me and much smarter, so he has been ahead in every aspect. But we are not competing with each other, we are supporting each other. When I joined the department, there were four more colleagues ahead of me. Richard Tiptoff was the most senior, then Rick Popert, Tim O'Brien, and Jonathan Glass. We were appointed in the same year. But ever since the department has mushroomed, there are 16 consultants. What is special about this urology department? I come every day and I really enjoy working in this department. The reason is that all my colleagues are exceptionally talented, they are highly skilled, they are excellent team players, and they inspire and celebrate each other's success. So most of them are here today. And I'm very grateful for their support over the last several years. There were others who were in the department but went to other places for personal reasons. <coughs> but we remain very good friends. They visit us. We see them in different social circumstances. As a full-time clinician, you have a job plan. And my job plan is 11.5 PAs, just like all other my colleagues are full-time consultants. My actual working hours are about 80 a week because I try to provide six to seven day care to my patients. Most of the academic work is done outside NHS hours and I use my annual leave for international work. So you must be wondering what about the family? Unfortunately, my home is just like bed and breakfast. I arrive late, I eat early. And in spite of that, my marriage has survived nearly 30 years. Thanks to my wife and my daughters who are very forgiving. Clinical milestones, what did we achieve in the last 17 years? Firstly, we were the first one to start robotic surgery program in UK. Thanks to my colleague, Prokar, who was obviously thinking ahead. 
We helped six other UK centers, myself, to establish the programs, European centers, gynecologists. And we couldn't have done this without the help from our friend and colleague from Eastbourne, Peter Remington, and our younger colleagues, Pete Ben Chalakam and Osama al Haj. They were the pillars of this program in the beginning. As a result of this program, because we started the robotics cystectomy program, we became the member, main contributor of the International Robotics Cystectomy Consortium, International Bladder Cancer Network several international meetings, and we published widely in all urology journals. There is no doubt that this robotic program at Guy's would not have been started without the support from the Guy's and St. Thomas's charity, and subsequently a very strong support from the chief executives of the trust, Michael, Jonathan Michael, Ron Kerr, currently Amanda Pritchard, and more importantly, Eileen Sills, because she had to write the check for the new robots. Everybody sees the, the main headlines, but we forget about people who work in the background, and I can assure you this program would not have been possible to start or progress without the support from our one of the senior theater nurses, Maria Nightingale, and many others who are in the team who help us day in and day out with this surgical program. As a result of our track record in, in robotic surgery, we were asked to write the curricula for the British Association of Urological Surgeons and also the European Urology. 70% of the patients who have bladder cancer have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer or superficial bladder cancer. We have made international headlines, particularly in the diagnostics uh, of the bladder cancer, photodynamic diagnosis and treatment of the bladder cancer, which is not muscle invasive. And this program was led by my two colleagues, Tim O'Brien, Kay Thomas, and supported by Eleanor Ray, who is a urologist now in Dartford, and the two specialist nurses, my peripheral support. We did study science of the bladder cancer, and Fahim Ismail completed PhD last year. He studied the role of this P21 activated kinase 5 or PAC5 in epithelial mesenchymal transition in bladder cancer. He investigated this pathway and came to two conclusions that PAC5 is associated with low-grade tumor cells and loss induces mesenchymal changes in high-grade tumor cells. He also concluded that it interacts with the E cadherin and P120 catenin to maintain the epithelial phenotype. So that was bladder cancer. Overactive bladder, the, the, I know there's mixed audience, some of them don't know the definition, but it's a very complex definition. So I thought if I show you a video, then you will understand better what the overactive bladder is. If you think you might become ill in six weeks time, then why not book an appointment today with your local GC? Carol, would you uh, bring the next patient in please? Thank you. Ah, Mrs. Emery. Nice to see you there. Hello, Doctor. Bitter out. Yes. So, what seems to be the trouble? I've got a bit of a problem, Doctor. Right. It's my knee. It's a little bit sore. Right, well, we've been out of rooms, you haven't we? Yes. <laughs> we'll just oh. that one here. <laughs> right. Ah, oh, yes, yes, it does look a little sore. Have you banged it at all? Well, we are <laughs> not. Oh, 
Foxy that silly, which is 1933. Swear so he hasn't gone down within a week. And then see me again. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Doctor. 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 So this is a condition which affects a large population over at almost 17% over the age of 40, and it increases with age. But the problem is the patients who suffer, they suffer in silence because they think there is no treatment for this condition. Previously, the only options were the patients had either the tablets, which worked in about 50-60% patients, or had major operations. We were fortunate to investigate the role of botulinum toxin for treatment of this condition at guys. We conducted two randomized controlled trials. We produced two PhDs. And as a consequence of our work, the drug got the license and now being used all over the world. The other clinical work I'm involved with is pelvic exenteration. Uh, Guys and St. Thomas is the largest program in London for advanced pelvic cancer. This is again a multidisciplinary work. Endometriosis, Guys and St. Thomas is the tertiary center for management of this condition. And it is again a joint program which is between gynecologists, the colorectal surgeons, and the urologists. When you are doing clinical work, you cannot do it alone. You have to depend on several other disciplines. So in our case, when I joined initially, I used to do transplants. So my transplant colleagues were extremely helpful, radiologists, pathologists, anesthetists, oncologists, and colorectal colleagues. They all help you in doing your day-to-day -day work, and I am extremely grateful to every one of them. We have teams of nurses and other staff members running our clinics, theaters, and the wards. And without them, nothing can be accomplished. Team of junior doctors and a passionate worker cleaner, Rita, who keeps the outpatients spot clean. And two of these women who maintain us to remain sane, otherwise we will lose our sanity because every day they deal with hundreds of calls. What about education and training? There are several challenges surgical <coughs> training has been facing recently because of patient safety issues, reduced working hours, diminished training opportunities, new technologies, and changing expectation of patients. We decided to explore the role of simulation in surgical training and started a program in 2010 in guys. This program was <coughs> subsequently rolled over all over the country. I visited all these centers in UK and Ireland and submitted a report to the British Association of Urological Surgeons and then wrote a curriculum for the trainees, which has been accepted by the GMC. We have made more progress in simulation, not only with the pilot at guys, national implementation, but ongoing randomized trial, which is an international trial to assess the validity of simulation. A MARS project, which is a project for assessment of the training tools for robotic surgery, and we are in the process of writing curriculum for the stone disease. And this work has mostly been possible because of the hard work by our juniors, particularly Kamran Ahmed, Nicholas Rezan, and Abdul Latif. We are thankful to Peter J for his collaboration. And we are thankful to all these gentlemen who actually supported our simulation program, including Nigel Stanfield, Roger Player, and nationally, Adrian Joyce, Kiran O'Flynn, and Mark Speakman. I got involved in the intercollegiate specialty board in urology in 2010. I 
led on the bladder and renal cancer uh, assessments. And after three years, I just stepped down because I took over Director Bowes Office of Education role, which I did for three years and finished recently. So as a Director Office of Education, I had the responsibility of running the FRC as you roll courses for the national and international trainees. And I brought several changes which resulted in improvement of the uh, course uh, profile and also for the core trainees. And I introduced new courses for the con consultants. And this was only possible by support from the colleagues and friends all over the country, hundreds of them actually helped to run these courses. I'm still a member of the SAC Neurology and Joint Committee of Surgical Training in Urology. What about the King's College London? Uh, I have been undergraduate lead for 10 years, 2004 to 14. Clinical advisor, running the BSc at the moment, undergraduate examinations, Work experience to a lot of students to inspire them to go into medicine. Clinical attachment for international doctors, trainees of the specialist trainees, and international fellows. We are very fortunate to have established the first bladder cancer robotic surgery fellowship at Guy's. I'm thankful to my colleague Ramesh who has been very supportive. And we have two excellent trainees, Rajesh Nair who went to Australia, and currently we have Brian Parsons I personally think he's a role model for many trainees in this country. Robotic surgical training has been a problem in the past because we had to send pay our trainees abroad. But last year, we got funding from the Urology Foundation and Intuitive Surgical, and we are delivering this training within this country. We are also fortunate to have Veticuti Foundation establishing the Veticuti robotic institute here at KCL and we are hoping that hopefully next year we have three robotic fellowships uh, in the country so that we can promote this surgical training even further. <coughs> so you must be wondering what all this and then how did I get my this title. So at the end of all this journey I'll work there were 210 papers <laughs> over 300 abstracts, two books, 10 book chapters, PhD supervision of three, BSc, and review of many journals, and an <coughs> index of about 25. With, in a, the books of academics is very low, but for a clinician, I think it is fairly respectable. And all these people have put the bricks in this building of professorship because you don't do this alone. You, do it with your other friends and colleagues. And I'm grateful to each and every one of them for being co-authors in various publications. Internationally, I have been focusing on uh, laparoscopy, the minimally invasive stonework, reconstruction, and transplantation, principally in Pakistan, about seven centers in Pakistan, and also in Africa, in Rwanda. Currently, I'm working with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan to, re to develop some revision courses, skill workshops, international fellowship for the stone disease, revision of the curriculum, and restructure the exam, which is a bit outdated. And this international work has been only possible with the help of my friends and colleagues within UK and from abroad. And honestly, it has been a lot of work which has been done abroad, and this work has involved a lot of time from away from the country, the family, and everything. I must thank one individual who helped me to move from senior lecturer to reader position, Professor Stephen Chalakam. He reviewed my application and gave me some guidance how to improve it. When I applied for my promotion in 2014, the application is goes through two stages. One is the internal committee of eight, and then the King's College committee of 25 members. They are, most of them are very high-ranking academics. And I, my application was turned down in 2014. 
it was considered as a lightweight. And I'm most grateful to these three giants of academia who guided me and supported me to be successful in my next round of application, which was 2015. <laughs> so the success, we all have similar starting and finishing points. But where the difference is that some of us have motorway journeys and other convoluted route journey, and therefore our finish times may be very different. Timelines are different, but in my opinion, we should celebrate the finish lines and not necessarily the finish times. But, the, but those who are younger than me and aspiring to pursue the academic career pathway, it is about sweats and not suits. It is substance, not style. And some inspiration, but mostly it is perspiration. <laughs> so you have to work hard to achieve this. How, what does it matter to me, this professorship? Because it doesn't change anything in my life. I continue to do the same work every day. But it serves a benchmark, not only for my family, but also my junior colleagues. Secondly, it just proves the fact that if you work very hard, you will get justice and you will be successful whatever you want to achieve in life. Many things happen parallel to your professional career. And I just want to share a few things with you before I finish my talk. South Asian earthquake in, on 8th of October 2005 lasted only 40 seconds, and it took more than 100,000 lives. That inspired me, motivated me to go to the disaster zone, and also then find a charity called Far Peace of Mind. And this charity for the last 10 years has accomplished these things. Houses, about 80, for 80 families, education for children, drinking water, health care center, and also medical camps. I was invited to Buckingham Palace to receive OBE in 2007. I have seen this in some parts of the world. This is in my own country, Lahore, Pakistan. Children's Hospital, which is supposed to be the tertiary hospital, because they are so overwhelmed, they don't have beds that they put many children in one court. And we are defying all the natural rules. Even worse, you have children like this who are being ventilated by their parents. When you see these kind of things, you feel how fortunate we are in this country to have so many free healthcare facilities. I visited Rwanda several times and I had the opportunity of visiting the museum where you see all the horrific pictures how the humans killed each other. One million people died in 100 days. One million in 100 days. What about the family? I have four daughters. They are born from nine, between 1988 and 1993. Fortunately, they inherit their intelligence from the mother, not the father. And also their appearance is more like their mother. <laughs> but they grew, they grew as I was working, and they are mature ladies. So my eldest daughter, who is doing academic gastroenterology, is married to my son-in-law, Ahmed Iqbal, who is an academic endocrinologist. He's about to f finish his PhD. Hopefully, they will become professors at much younger age than myself. They have a beautiful daughter, but she does make me feel too old, because when they say grandfather, then you feel that you know, there's something not right. <laughs> I have three other daughters who are all pursuing career in medicine. One is already a doctor, and two about to become doctors. What price you pay for your ambitions? Go to sleep late, still wake up early. You miss family time. 
you fund your travel if you are going to do voluntary work, and as a consequence, your private practice suffers. I'm not interested in private work, but little bit of private work you do, if you want to do it, then it suffers. I have no problems that people who work in private sector, they are as friendly to me as in the NHS. You get some punches. You do receive some punches, usually mental, not physical in your journey. Sometimes it leaves you bruised, and other times it will knock you out completely. You will be very depressed. But remember, the defeat is not declared when you fall down, but only when you refuse to get up. The future, everyone thinks about future, but it's something we enter, something we create. And I do think about my future as a, as a prof, you know, doctor and a, as a professor and now ageism. In, in Britain, we are very conscious of our ages and we think that once you cross certain age limit, you are actually not good enough for anything. Royal College is holding a conference. How old is too old to operate? I think it's biology, not chronology. I've seen many older surgeons who are still practicing. <coughs> I'm not promoting that, but I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> they say that physical, mental, and social activity is good for the brain and reduces the risk of dementia. This is one thing I don't want to have in my life. <coughs> Should there be an age limit for being head of the state? America has just elected 70-year-old men for the next four years. 70-year-old. They rejected 69, and we sacked our young prime minister and opted for an older one, for a more mature one. But I am conscious that the employers also consider health when you are hiring you. So what key messages I want to leave you with, that it is your road and you are alone. Others may walk it with you, but no one can walk it for you. So it is the attitude, not the aptitude, which determines your altitude. It is better to look back on your life and say, I can't believe I did that, than to look back and say, I wish I did that. And remember the hard times that you go through build your character, making you a much stronger person. And God gives the hardest battles to the strongest soldiers. And the strong people don't put others down, they lift them up. So aspire to inspire before you aspire. <coughs> So I thank you sincerely for your kind attention and invaluable time. And Almighty God for blessing me much more than I deserve. Thank you so much. Shamim Khan does not deliver lectures. Shamim Khan does not deliver lectures. He delivers little valuable nuggets of knowledge. He's always done this and he does this better than anyone else. Shamim, I came as your registrar. I am still your registrar. <laughs> I'm still learning from you every day and it would be a silly person in this room who doesn't do that. On behalf of our team within our academic division, the Urology Center, Baus, your many fans, I wanted to thank you sincerely for your contribution to science. Shamim, ladies and gentlemen, is
to my knowledge, the first professor of surgical education at King's. I just wanted to finish by saying something that Shamim hasn't mentioned, and I'll quote that from Samuel Beckett. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Shamim Khan. Thank you all for coming and have a very safe journey home. But there is also some refreshments, I think, that Professor I'll, I'll will... just say uh, a <laughs> <laughs> I've got to have some role here. <laughs> uh, well, just to re uh, reaffirm, and may I say on behalf of the faculty and convey my most sincere congratulations to both of our inaugural lecturers this evening. We have had a really wonderful exposition of accomplishment. So uh, my most sincere thanks and congratulations. Um, we do have some refreshments. Uh, they, uh, we, it's a short journey. I think there's some, uh, it's well signposted. So please, I know it's already rather late, but if you are able to, please do come and join us and have your own opportunity to congratulate uh, our two new professors. Thank you very much.